hello again. Uh, with the uh, increase of popularity of uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and all this somehow intelligent algorithms, the media picked it up, and we believe that media is not the proper um, source of information. Where do we stand when we say artificial intelligence? So in that regard, uh, we thought that is uh, appropriate to have a discussion uh, about artificial intelligence with some people that actually know what they're talking about, uh, or at least uh, know what they're talking about uh, AI-wise. So I'm going to run a quick introduction. Uh, this is Nemanja. Uh, Milosevic? Oh my god. I, I'm really bad with names, sorry. Uh, Nemanja Milosevic is an assistant professor of Did artificial you? intelligence at the University of Nami Sad, uh, at the uh, Faculty of Math. Is that the proper? Uh, assistant, uh, teaching assistant at Faculty of Sciences in University of Nami Sad. Okay, I, I practice this, but... I, I practice feel. it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, also a good friend of ours, uh, I mean, uh, Hackerspace to the center. And, uh, well, he obviously knows what he's talking about when, when we are uh, talking about artificial intelligence. And uh, some of you saw, that, uh, uh, saw him uh, earlier on a... Um, oh my God, on a workshop. So he's also a big fan of Python, or at least a fan of Python. Uh, <coughs> I should have started with a lady, right? But uh, the lady is, um, for those of you who read robots from Isaac Asimov, they know what uh, robo-psychologist means. It's a really cool character in his book, and it's a female, uh, so Introducing robo psychologist in the future, Maya Sanovich. She is a pedagogue interested in anything and everything, but for the sake of this uh, discussion, uh, she's a novice Python programmer, uh, obviously a good pedagogue and a, a psychologist. And uh, as robots or intelligence is becoming more and more intelligent, we kind of expect uh, people to uh, be caught off guard if they are not into psychology. And we will see what that means. Uh, just, uh, hi, everybody. Just uh, one thing I wanted to say. When I married, I changed my name to make it, so. <laughs> <laughs> Last but not least, my favorite professor, uh, he taught me that whenever there's a, a lot of words in a title in math, that means that uh, theory is actually really, really restricted. What is hard is say, okay, theory about math. And uh, this professor here, uh, Dragan Mashulovic, teaches math at the math university. So he covers all of the math uh, professionally. And uh, as he would like to say, he's a free thinking being and he's thinking really, really good about the um, AI and the whole this movement. And I learned a lot about artificial intelligence from this source. So say hello. Uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> uh, we're going to start with, uh, so this is the idea. She does have uh, questions written down for uh, prepared questions for, for our panelists. But what we would like you to <coughs> do is raise your hand whenever you want to ask something. And then, well, probably I will run to you with the mic because uh, well, 
Honestly, this is my court now, and I get to ask the questions about these professors, so I, I would like them not to be prepared, just like I was. Uh, but seriously, yeah, we, we want you all to think and to, to include your thoughts, so if you have anything to say, just raise your hand. Uh, this is planned for an hour, but we have two hours uh, of uh, free time uh, in the venue, so we, even if we breach the hour, one hour uh, time limit, don't worry about it, just ask. And now Maya, hit it. Okay. Um, so today we are confronted with two different views. Uh, one view of artificial intelligence is basically uh, your average startup buzzword. So everything has to be IE based this year at least. Uh, so basically the idea is if you are selling to investors you have to include artificial intelligence. It's a sexy word and every company needs to have something IE-based. Uh, on the other hand, we have, um, we have people from mass media who are always saying that robots, robots are going to kill us and take our job. So uh, before we begin, um, let's get to the basics. Um, Let's uh, define what are we talking about. What is uh, intelligence, artificial in intelligence, and heuristics? So um, let's first uh, define the basic um, terms. What are we going to talk about today? Um, would you like to start, Dragon? Yes, of course. There. Are. Uh, let's start with intelligence. First of all, there is no definition of intelligence whatsoever. If you read any textbook on psychology or artificial intelligence, you will see that you will find a lot of discussion about the notion, but actually we don't know what intelligence is. There is no formal defini definition of intelligence. It is a quality that humans exhibit, and that's the only thing that I can say for certain. Everything else, going into specifics, turns it to something trivial. And uh, perhaps this can be uh, seen very simply because the only efficient test that can be applied to test if a software is intelligent is actually the Turing test, which starts from the same premises. We don't know what we cannot make an explicit definition of intelligence, but we can observe intelligent behavior and recognize it. So the Turing test is, is exactly based on this fact. So intelligence is something that we have, we can recognize, we can evaluate, but we cannot explicate. Uh, artificial intelligence, on the other hand, is a set of tools or software strategies to ser solve certain problems that before the appearance of computers have been attributed solely to humans, right? And the easiest thing to define are heuristics. I, I believe that a heuristic is an algorithm that is actually based on human experience where you do not have the proof, formal proof that it's optimal, but our experience tells us that it should provide reasonable or good answers. Okay. Uh, what do you think, Nemanja, is intelligence? How would you define it if somebody asks you what is intelligence? Well, I, I will also say it's a human quality. I, I think it's very difficult to define, as Professor said. Uh, I think it's much easier to define artificial intelligence as uh, a term which uh, signifies that a machine can use something as well or better than humans. So that's, I, th I think, uh, is one definition of artificial intelligence, but it's, it's uh, very uh, difficult to, to, to define the term. Uh, okay, but um, I'll have to ask, uh, why are we uh, solely uh, concentrating on human intelligence. There are some animals that are s still considered very smart and people are building robots that um, l look like or behave like some animals. So why are we concentrating in this discussion only on the human-based intelligence? Well, I think uh, 
we have to first measure intelligence and we know about IQ tests and things like that but I don't know if that's a good metric I don't know what professor thinks about it <laughs> but uh, whenever I see this uh, headline like we taught our algorithm so it's uh, smart as a seven-year-old or whatever it's I think it's just uh, media buzzwords things like that so I, I think it's very uh, I even think the metric like the IQ test I don't think it's a very good metric for intelligence in general so uh, to define something you have to measure it somehow and it's difficult to measure that's why I think it's difficult to define uh, heuristics I would go uh, one step uh, further just to say I w when uh, uh, when someone asks me what heuristics is, I always think about, you know, you know, d d from the development side. So when you're developing an algorithm, you need to define a heuristic function, which is a function that basically tells you is the way your algorithm is going is, is correct or not. So mm, that's, that, that would be s just something to add to what Professor said. But yeah, that's it, I think. Um, one more question related to what you said. Uh, you said that uh, uh, in media you can see uh, question uh, statements like that artificial intelligence is trained like a seven-year-old. If uh, the artificial intelligence didn't pass the Turing test, yeah, uh, can we actually say that it has r any resemblance okay, to so an the age? The Turing test is something best we have for now. The but only thing we the have. The only thing we have. So Actually, yeah. So, so the best <laughs> thing? <laughs> yes. And, and the best but thing, yeah. But, uh, yeah, you have to think, uh, you know, uh, okay, so if, uh, if an algorithm can classify animals as good as a seven-year-old, it doesn't mean that the algorithm is in it as intelligent as a seven-year-old. It just means that it can classify images as well as a seven-year-old. Okay, so I think this discussion is going then towards general intelligence or general artificial intelligence. So we are now focusing, um, the, I think the, the, the media issue that you mentioned is that there is some small uh, accomplishment in, in uh, AI world and immediately everyone thinks, okay, this is it, you know, and everything is now uh, done. We have figured out uh, intelligence and artificial intelligence, which is wrong, I think. Okay. Um, so um, some of you probably saw a video of Boston Dynamics, they were testing their uh, new robot and uh, what was problematic about it was that they were hitting it with the different clubs or stuff or, uh, well, what was really interesting about the reaction of people who watched that video was, uh, is that robot going to turn to them and uh, like hit them uh, back actually that was uh, like a general response from the public so um, what happens when artifi artificial intelligence becomes self-aware and it actually understands that we are the ones who are hitting them so th the whole concept of us versus them so is that possible um, and when is that thing going, going to happen so would you like to start um, see an artificial intelligence an artificial intelligence system is actually a software so being uh, self-aware means that somebody has included certain code that tests the status of certain sensors and then performs certain, certain actions. So a robot who hits back is a machine that has been instructed to do so. Uh, self-awareness, that's something perhaps even more intangible than intelligence because, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an attribute, I deeply believe that it's an attribute that cannot be attributed to machines. As long as we are based on Turing machines as a computational concept, a Turing machine cannot be self-aware. It can only act in a certain way according to a particular program. So uh, such responses from machines have to be premeditated, coded, tested, and actually enforced by human programmers. 
but is it possible if the machine is actually supposed to learn something in the future? Is it possible for us to train something that is going to hit us back? Of course. You can write a very simple program that can, you know, you can very easily instruct a robot to hit back. It's not, it's not an issue. We can do it. What we are discussing here is the notion of self-awareness and free will whether the machine can decide by its own free will to take or not to take certain action. And that makes sense. I, I strongly believe that this is not something that can happen as long as we are based on computers, uh, on actually the Turing machine model. Okay, what do you think? Uh, I think what, you, what you're saying is not uh, the problem of self-awareness, but problem of uh, the, ma the machine deciding what to learn. Okay, so for in all uh, machine learning algorithms and AI algorithms, you teach the algorithm something, okay? So the, the moment that machine can somehow get free will and then learn what it wants, okay? But, but to do that, it has, to has it, it has to have free will. Then maybe it can happen that, you know, even though it's not programmed explicitly by us to hit us back, it will hit us back. But I think that's very difficult to, to happen as long as we are uh, in this model that we are ha having now. Okay, so the issue is not of self-awareness, but of free will, as Professor said. Okay, so because you can program the machine to be self-aware or not program it to be self-aware, but the issue is if you program a machine to learn whatever it wants, then you are kind of giving it free will because learning is, you know, how you uh, extend di different functionalities of that machine. Okay, so I think we have a question here or a statement. Test. Okay, <coughs> so uh, we can program a machine to hit us back, of course, but during our pro programming, shouldn't we have some safety measures to comply with uh, three laws of robotics? Yes, uh, yes, of course, but again, that's something that a programmer has to impose on a computer, and as long as we have to order the computer to hit somebody or order the computer to restrain itself from hitting somebody, there is no intelligence or free will in involved. It's just executing a We're code. Executing our code, yes. Yeah. yeah. So if we stick to the uh, Turing machines and the currently three laws, probably more as as uh, intelligence grows, we we would we would avoid the problem of machine hitting us back. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. I mean, you, we can make intelligent tanks. Actually, the new Russian, the, the latest Russian tank, Armata, can operate on a field independently and hit the targets independently. But it doesn't mean that this tank has a free will and that this tank will ever be uh, um, subjected to the human rights uh, courts. You know. It is just a machine executing certain pre-programmed tasks. Yeah. Uh, so, we were talking about the free will, and um, where are we, uh, what is the current level of AI, uh, of general purpose AI? Um, does, where are we from uh, the basic concept of free will? Are we um, on the maybe amoeba level, or is is it slowly progressing towards something more intelligent? Well, I, I don't know about amoebas or anything, sorry. <laughs> but uh, I think we're very far from general purpose AI. I'm, if you mean like general purpose, like he can do anything, I think that's, I, I'm not sure if it's even possible, but de definitely we are very far from it. Uh, I think the the uh, the next wave, let's say, of of academic research, will be improving what we have already and thinking about some new algorithms and new ways of learning. There are still many areas that we didn't explore, like like uh, sp uh, sp uh, speech generation and what uh, what uh, other uh, areas. So I think that's the 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 way we're going forward. We are only moving, s even though it it looks like we're moving in these huge leaps ahead. I think. If you follow the, the 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 research in artificial intelligence and machine learning, it's uh, it's not that fast as it looks like from media. Let's say, okay, there are some advancements, but not uh, that much towards general purpose AI. 
which is, I think, very difficult. If we are defining general purpose AI as an AI ca that can do anything without any supervision. Okay. Uh, what do you think? I will be even, I mean, even more strict. I strongly believe that general purpose AI is impossible. Uh, AI nowadays is actually a set of algorithms that tries to help humans do certain high-level tasks. And we are getting better and better. Actually, we are getting so good at that that there is a recent study of OECD published last year uh, in which they uh, analyzed uh, medium-level skill jobs to low-level skill jobs, which are actually in danger of getting replaced by current AIs. So we are getting very good at increasing uh, the capabilities of our machines. But that does not mean that these machines are getting becoming intelligent. They are just more and more capable to execute more and more tasks, which are which until recently have been uh, exclusively. Uh, uh, performed by humans. So yes, as a, as a set of tools that can make our life easier and that can perform more and more sophisticated tasks, yes, AI is progressing very quickly. But general purpose AI is simply impossible. And just to conclude, um, actually there was a huge uh, surprise in the AI community and those funding AI community in 1992 when Marvin Minsky published his famous article. You, you, I guess you've heard of Marvin, Marvin Minsky. He was one of the founders of AI. AI as a, no, as, as, as a, as a research di direction was founded in 1956. There was a meeting at Dartmouth College and the meeting was, uh, at the meeting were John McCarthy, Claude Shannon, uh, Marvin Minsky, uh, Alan Newell, uh, Okay, basically the, the big names of AI, those you can find, find in AI books, and they started this notion uh, basically in their w attempt to try to recreate this general uh, uh, point of view of AI. However, in 1992, Marvin Minsky, I'll actually read an excerpt. Just let me find Minsky's excerpt. Uh, Marvin Minsky published an article but when he retired. That's also important. I mean, he's been surfing on this on, on this wave of AI for 40 years, g g getting huge amounts of grant money, building laboratories, buying computers, employing young, young people, making great programs. <coughs> but when he retired, <coughs> he published a document in which he actually apologized to all those who provided uh, cash for his research for 40 years. He actually said the main problem seemed to be that each of our so-called expert systems could be used only for some single specialized application. None of them showed what a person would call, call general intelligence. None of them showed any signs of having what we call common sense. This is a quote of Marmin Minsky, a guy who actually invented the notion AI and worked in the field for 40 years. So. I believe that I it is a matter of common sense to simply understand that general purpose AI is just a childish dream. What makes sense and what we should invest is modern AI, which is a set of tools and techniques where we try to uh, make computers capable of doing complex tasks. So you said that we are um, building AI that can uh, take simple tasks. Like, um, at what moment in the future can we expect actually for robots to take our job? <laughs> uh, it's happening at the moment. And uh, in, in 2018, actually last year, OECD published published uh, an, an analysis of jobs. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, let me just read a, a short conclusion of this analysis. About 14% of jobs in OECD countries are highly automatable. Another 32% of jobs could face substantial change in how they are carried out. So we are talking about 45% of all, all the jobs in Western countries which they believe are subject to change radically because of AI. We are talking about people who will simply lose their jobs because they will be replaced by 
computers. One of the surprising jobs that is at stake is are actually, actually, let's say, bank tellers. Bank tellers will easily be replaced by IBM Watson, can easily be replaced by IBM Watson. Right? Interesting. <laughs> yeah, seriously. So these are serious analysis. You can find them online, just Google OECD AI lo uh, losing jobs or whatever, and you'll get this analysis. It's, it's a very uh, significant one. Uh, what do you think about the uh, future of AI? So we, oh, what happens in 50 or 100 years? Now we, we can't say for certain, <coughs> and I don't ex expect you to, to see the future, but can we predict something that can be uh, done in 50 or 100 years? What do you think? Where are we going? I think we're going to follow the current trends, what Professor said, like more and more uh, different uh, job types are going to be replaced by AI, which if you think about your own jobs, almost everything can be automated on it, if you have something that, you know, can think instead of you, which is nice because then you have to think. And I hope this happens sooner than later because in this future, you know, you don't have to work, you just play video games at home, you know, you take a walk, it's nice, so you don't have to work, machines will work for us. So I think in, in the next uh, uh, 50 or 100 years or whatever, I think the, 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 the these algorithms that are doing these specific tasks are going to get better and better. And the hardware is also uh, uh, getting better, so we can explore some new uh, models, because you have to remember that uh, all this hype about neural networks wouldn't happen if we didn't have this explosion of uh, cheap uh, graphics cards and uh, cheap uh, compute power. So I think it's just going to uh, follow this same direction, but you know, even more uh, advancements will be made in, in uh, doing specific tasks. You can see already that self-driving cars are going to become a thing. So, uh, you know, I, I, in, a, in, a, in a perfect world, a self-driving car means a safer, uh, safer way to travel. You know, you don't have to think, w you know, who is driving that car that's going towards me and why. Is he going to, you know, fall asleep or something? So I think, in in that sense, I think the uh, to put on a, a, a bright smile, I think the the world will be a, will be a better place because of AI in the next fifty or hundred years. Mm, and we will not be uh, killed by robots. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I hope so. I'm still a bit skeptical. So, uh, what do you think? Uh, are we getting a Skynet in a hundred years or fifty or sooner? No, no, no. We are not getting Skynet. Definitely, Skynet was supposed to get operational on twelfth of July, nineteen ninety-two. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, as every software, it's late. Yeah, yeah it's late for <laughs> yes. <laughs> so actually, Skynet is passé. Uh, I don't believe that we will ever see the future where computers are, you know, walking the streets as free. As free thinking, free will beings, and uh, try to somehow you know fight with humans over resources. Of course not. However, uh, the future I believe is not going to be very bright, simply because many people will be left with no jobs. So, unless you have some specific skill, or unless you are highly trained to do your job you will be easily replaced by a computer. And that's the, the future I'm afraid we are facing. One of, the, one of the indicators of that is that you can hear more and more loudly in recent years, uh, the discussion is opening about a social security system called universal basic income. So governments are already realizing that there will be a huge amount of jobs that will be taken over by computers, and then you, they be, you, you will end up with a lot of low-skilled people who won't be able to get a new job. The way to handle that is to simply give them money for free. So y UBI, Universal Basic Income, is, is, is a social security system where every adult citizen will get a certain amount of money regardless of what he or she does. So enough to provide for housing and basic food in hope that those who lose their jobs will find this comforting. Well, that's not bad. <laughs> that's very bad. I'm, I'm sorry, but that's very bad. 
So, uh, so it simply means you know, this also. For, for me, it looks a bit like you know, this Orwellian future when governments are ready to sacrifice a portion of its population, 30% of its population, in the sense we don't need your skills. And since you're incapable to find a niche where your skills are unique, you will just be left to, uh, no, to leave your days until you pass away. That's a very disturbing image. And somehow I'm not happy with it. It's even worse than seeing computers, you know, robots running down the streets and fighting with humans for, for you know, electricity or resources. Okay, w so we have uh, one or two questions, three questions. Uh, great. Are they all mine? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> there is a person behind you, so <laughs> no. So you were talking about uh, specialized AI that does tons of jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't general AI collection of specialized ones? And if yes, well, doesn't that contradict your statement? If no, how not? Mm -hmm. Okay, no. <laughs> 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 and now, how not? Uh, you see, uh, the, 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 uh, what makes us qualitative, qualitatively different from computers are certain qualities which are indefinable, but we can sense them, like intelligence, creativity, fallibility. You know, the possibility to make a mistake. That's a, a unique human. Uh, that, that's unique for us humans. You know, errare humanum est. It's human to err. Therefore, this is what makes us different from computers, and this is something we will never be able to achieve creativity, ingenuity, insight. You know, there was, there was an attempt in 1960s, let's say, to, 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 to write a program that will be able to solve uh, elementary school mathematics problems. It was called GPS, that's before the GPS era. GPS at that time meant general purpose solver. And Newman was one of the authors. Uh, <coughs> and actually it failed. And this pro project stopped and was never take, uh, it was never continued. Simply, we are unable to provide a level of ingenuity that is necessary to solve elementary mathematical problems. So there is a competition, worldwide known competition called uh, Kangaroo. It's po popular even in Serbia, we call it Kangur. And these are very elementary mathematical problems. You, you don't, actually, you don't need uh, mathematical skills to solve the problems. You just need the creativity and this, you know, insight. That's what computers will never be able to do. And that what, what, that's what makes us different from our machines, which I deeply respect and use on a daily basis and, you know, try to contribute to, 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 to this society and community. But somehow, you know, there are certain things that we have to be aware of. General purpose AI is simply impossible. We will never be able to emulate certain qualities that are typically human. I just I would just like to add to your uh, to, mm -hmm. to the answer. You said like if you have all these different AIs and then you combine them somehow, but that's uh, based on a hypothesis that you even you can make all those AIs that can replace all the jobs. Maybe there are some jobs that there certainly there are some jobs like programming that you cannot replace by AI today. <laughs> Not okay. all programming. N next question. Okay, so uh, I might be going off topic here a bit, but uh, I just couldn't resist to ask about the universal basic income. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you consider it such a bad thing? Because that might leave more space for people to go into arts and turn to a different side to do things that computers cannot do, as you answered to the previous question. Well, I admire your faith in humans. <laughs> 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 but no, really, because uh, it's usually not if you look at it short, short term, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, people yeah. That just go towards the easiest thing and, and mm -hmm. just remain consumers of the uh, entertainment, let's say mm -hmm. it like mm -hmm. that. But at some point, all of the, because we have a lot of 
we basically have an explosion of it on the internet currently because now a lot of people are also generating content on yeah. different on daily basis so it's not that it's that dark that's why i'm asking because i got the vibe that it's that you have this really really dark vision of it uh, see that, that was the uh, original uh, so the original motivation to introduce ubi is precisely to you know, um reduce costs of other ways of social social security of other uh, mechanisms social security mechanisms and the letting people giving people more free time to try to explore their capability and i believe that some portion of pe of those guys will actually use ubi for those purposes however i fear that most of people under under ubi will simply reduce to you know remote button pushers and that I, I i fear that yeah really thank okay, you okay we have um, more questions can you so uh, I have, well, it's it's a bit of question and a bit like of opinion. Uh, there is a project funded among others. Uh, uh, Amazon was one of the uh, biggest founder uh, of the project. They analyzed world literature using the AI and the data mining and everything. And there is a quite uh, thing because they want to find out what makes the good novel what makes the good poem what makes and the basic problem is that we humans haven't uh, totally achieved and wrapped around our free will uh, purpose meaning of life meaning of our own existence because we are always seeking that and uh, also the biggest stuff is um, love and accepting uh, false as a true accepting errors as a beauty, uh, like the service as a beauty, accepting uh, not so good roads that will lead to something new. So I, uh, in general, I don't think that the machines in any way will be able to be programmed by the folks that haven't figured it out themselves. Exactly. So that's the, the mainly problem mm -hmm. in, in, in creating free will and, and the opinion of life of folks that haven't figured it out for themselves for thousands of years. <laughs> so that's the main problem in, in this. So there is no orchestrator, main intelligent that will pick in one moment <coughs> handyman, in another moment father, in another moment worker, that will pick subroutine. So I don't think that there will be ever general purpose AI yeah. in a sense. So that's just uh, <coughs> just one opinion and uh, all AI we are building is modeled upon us. So I, com I completely agree with you. So we, we, we don't know it. So how could something that we're making know it? And uh, the question is, what are the jobs that you think 100% that will stay human? Mm -hmm. uh, anything that involves creativity or insight, oh. teaching. Um, so all creative jobs, problem solving, anything involving problem solving, these are typically human activities. Uh, teaching, it's very hard to learn from an online resource. It's much easier to learn from a human. And we will never be able to, to program robots to behave as human teachers. You can have an android pretending to be a human, but it's, it's always going to be a, a mannequin that is somehow executing scripts. A human teacher, yeah. Uh, I, uh, see, teaching has been around for literally the beginning of time, tens of thousands of years, and we've gone through all shapes of societies, but teaching has always become, has always remained a, a, a personal activity, a person talking to other person. And you know, what distinguishes a good teacher from a bad teacher, I say one easy thing to identify are emotions. An emotional teacher without emotions is a bad teacher. Uh, so it, it's an emotional business. Whenever something involves emotions, that's a typically human job. And you, you, you can find, uh, I mean, uh, the list is large. It doesn't mean that the entire humanity will be reduced to uh, UBI pilots. receivers. Would you go in a plane that has no pilots? Just so you know he's there, you know, if something goes wrong. Well, if you, if you give me a parachute, maybe <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> 
<laughs> okay, next question. Okay, so uh, follow up on the UBI discussion. Uh, so my personal opinions incline uh, more with yours than my colleagues and your colleagues there, and I don't really see a happy end there. Uh, what I wanted to ask is that uh, in today's world, you know, big co and mega corporations have uh, a more and more larger influence in the well, big decision making mm -hmm. and influence. I, uh, what I see happening in the future is uh, them influencing countries mm -hmm. and some bigger decisions there. And uh, what I wanted to ask is what happens when uh, they decide that the number of people uh, supported by UBI is, is enough and they would limit it there. And if that happens. That's a very good question. I don't know. I don't know how to answer it. All, right. All the plans I've seen or I've read at the moment uh, are inclusive in the sense every human being is entitled to, uh, every adult is entitled to a universal basic. But I think income. the problem is that not everyone loses their jobs. If like everyone loses no, 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 their jobs, of course, of course, that would be then uh, that would be perfect because then no one works, you know, machines work for us and we're all happy. But problem is there is this part of the population who lose their jobs and the other who doesn't and you see this uh, difference and that's that's the issue i think please take the microphone if uh, um socially it's happening right now some yes, people but I, I, don't have jobs but what i think is that if um answer to his question what job will be remained while ai maintenance <laughs> <laughs> okay we had uh, marco had a question uh, in the uh, early s uh, in the late 70s or early 80s i don't really know uh, when uh, in yugoslavia was uh, considered uh, the uh, to get the computer programming in schools. Mm -hmm. uh, our politicians were strongly opposing it, saying that uh, while we have the personnel, uh, while the time passes that we have personnel to teach computer programming, the computers will be programming themselves. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, how far are we from that? Infinitely far. Computers will never be able to program themselves. Okay, thanks. That's a creative job, and that's one of the things that computers, based on the Turing machine model, are incapable of. Okay, okay thanks. So we are uh, all AI mechanics. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we all here are doomed to be AI mechanics. <laughs> um. Uh, hi. So I guess everybody here is mostly in agreement that the general purpose AI is quite impossible. Huh? While I'm not saying I disagree, but I want to spark a talk. Is it so inconceivable that in this started as a question about the future? Is it so inconceivable that in the, in the future we will go beyond the Turing model and use quantum computers? Or we don't have to uh, assume that we have to figure out everything in order to make AI that knows all of that. Like, we have to figure out which poem is beautiful in order to AI to be able to figure out the same thing. I mean, we evolved. If we create something based on non-Turing uh, machines that can evolve as well, maybe it can reach the point where it has more insight than we do. So what's your opinion on that? Uh, okay, so first about quantum computers. Uh, quantum computers at the moment are incapable of going beyond Turing computability. So quantum computers can do the same thing as regular computers, except they're supposed to be faster in certain aspects. Okay. So, what the, the next question, the next part of your question is actually more. I it's it's about what I what happens when we go beyond Turing computability. And to tell you the truth, I don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows at the moment. We have had only something like 80 years of, of computer program experience. So the first computer. Okay, maybe a hundred, but let's say less than a century. So, and during this very short span of time, we have invented hundreds of computational models. And all of them are equivalent or weaker than the Turing machine. This is the origin of the church Turing thesis that everything we are capable, we humans are capable of conceiving 
is actually going to be Turing equivalent, uh, Turing computable. So at the moment, uh, based on our experience in, in this short period of history, we are unable to go beyond the Turing machines. If somebody manages to do that, that's going to be a huge surprise for everybody. And then let's, let's talk about it then. At the moment, that's all I can say. Nemanja, what do you think? I completely agree. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, Hello again. So uh, you have said that you have said that a lot of jobs will be lost. Actually, computers would do it. But what makes the difference now when compared to the history? Because we had a lot of machines mm -hmm. uh, already mm -hmm. already do our work for us, yep. and uh, a lot of people who supposedly should lose their jobs actually mm -hmm. got qualified to do the jobs on a different level. Exactly. So what's the difference now with the AI? Because we can actually do the same, teach people to do different jobs. That, that's the key issue. Uh, you know, th 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 this uh, m idea about people being afraid of machines taking over their jobs is old. It's not something you... It started with the beginning of the industrialization. It, you had Nedo Ludo in the Netherlands and the Ludists. Until now, the idea was that some people will lose their jobs, but they will be able to, uh, the societies will be able to retrain them to do other jobs. For example, uh, there will be no weavers, human weavers, we will install mechanical weavers, but then those humans will be able to, we will retrain them to be mechanics, to repair those weavers. So the, the, fi the thing is, you're replacing one low-level skill job with another low-level skill job. And this idea of retraining became popular at the beginning of the un industrial uh, age. And it has been around until recently. You know that our government, the government of the Republic of Serbia, started a program where the idea was to retrain people to become computer programmers. It, it started last year. We are talking about recent events. So uh, the ministry announced very, uh, you know, they announced the program, they, they enrolled people. And then there was a huge dropout rate, and out of those few who managed to get a course, only a handful got the job. And the program was so unsuccessful that actually our ministry very quietly uh, dropped the, the entire program. The idea is now, the problem now is that we are, the, the AIs are putting low level skill jobs out of business and introducing new high level skill jobs. That's the major difference between, let's say, the 21st century and the 20th and century. And not everyone is suitable for and a high-level job. So people cannot be retrained to... No, you cannot train a bank teller who simply counts the money and fills in forms suddenly to program AIs and do it in six months. Yes, of course. Th I that's, the, that's the issue. <laughs> I, I agree with that point, but still, if you give... If you give a person free money for nothing, he's not going to even want to train for something. That's another issue, yes. Okay, I see that uh, we have here a lot of uh, hidden artists who would like to uh, do art instead of programming. We did art. <laughs> <laughs> Just but uh, since we are on a Python conference, let's get back to, to, to Python. Uh, so do you think that actually Python is the language of AI? If yes, well, why do you think that Python is the language of AI? If you don't agree, what do you think is the problem? I think if Python is the language of AI, and the simple reason is that, you know, it allows for fast prototyping. Any language that allows for fast prototyping is going to be good with, uh, with uh, AI tasks, because you'd have to do a lot of experiments when developing AI algorithms, and that's why uh, I think Python is somehow separated itself from other languages. And the an another reason is that we already had all these uh, different uh, good libraries for data processing in Python, so Python is good for working with data, and you know AI and machine learning especially is very dependent on uh, working with uh, large amounts of data, so naturally Python becomes one of the dominant languages in this, uh, in this area. What do you think? I agree with Nemanja. <laughs> 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 no, seriously. So, as long as the language is Turing complete, it's good for AI. Now, of course, uh, the AI community should pick 
a language that it finds most suitable for its task. I do not belong to the developer to the developer community, so I refrain from exposing my points of view. I fully agree with Nemanja. <laughs> uh, question? Do you think that need for speed is going to be a reason to remove Jill? Uh, no, because I like to write my code in Python, and I don't care if a backend is written by someone else in C++ or CUDA code or whatever. Um, so the first time when I actually heard about AI and neural networks, uh, I had a very strange thought. Where do you actually start with uh, training an AI? Do you just like go on Google, type uh, neural networks and download it? And uh, how does that process actually work? So um, c can you explain like for somebody who didn't do that? Yes. So first of all, you will need a lot of coffee. And a lot, you know, a lo you, 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 you need some uh, uh, very, uh, very strong, you know, uh, soft skills to, to no, not soft skills, sorry. <laughs> you need some uh, uh, work ethics to be able to keep yourself when something is not working and you don't know why to, you know, ju not just uh, throw it away. Uh, but uh, seriously, you know, there's all this uh, uh, content online that you can learn from. A lot of uh, uh, good universities uh, uh, are giving their content for free about AI. I recommend I recommend to almost everyone the Stanford courses about neural networks. I think they're a very good starting point uh, for uh, uh, for someone who wants to you know uh, start working with uh, AI and neural networks. So I think you don't need you have to have some obviously programming experience quite quite some experience and you have to have some background in uh, uh, in math but uh, you know th these things can be it's not impossible to learn them even if you're not still in uh, school or university or whatever it's not it's not that difficult to to under if you really want to to work with it uh, well i saw a lot of courses and some are um Machine learning and some are AI. Can okay, so machine learning is just a subset of AI. Okay, AI is general, artificial intelligence algorithms, things like that. Machine learning is basically a subset of those algorithms that is data driven. Okay, so you don't want to uh, program your uh, algorithms, you want them uh, to be learned somehow from the data. So, to uh, from some data patterns, you want to extract some information which will then make your algorithm smart. So that's the that's the difference. Okay, AI is, uh, you, you know, if if a software tells you that uh, you forgot to fill in something, that is already AI in my opinion. Okay, so I'm filling up a huge form, and I don't see all the fields at the same time, and I forget something which is important. And if a software tells me you forgot this, then thank you, you know. So that's that's already AI, but machine learning is something completely different. Machine learning is taking these uh, huge amounts of data and uh, you know trying to make uh, uh, some some algorithm work uh, the inner uh, relations in that data. Okay, uh, would you like to add a good starting point for somebody? Uh, as a as a teacher, it is my ethical obligation to say that a good starting point is enrolling into a good computer science course <laughs> <laughs> at some reasonable university. <laughs> so uh, I believe that, you know, <coughs> what one needs first is the understanding of, of foundations of computer science, starting from elementary programming skills and then building slowly onwards. Uh, I don't believe that jumping directly into AI research without reasonable foundations provided by any reasonable university is, is a wise thing to do. <laughs> because, you know, as Nyamanya said, AI is about complex algorithms, managing data, uh, so you have to be aware of um, no, efficient data structures, efficient algorithms to ma manipulate data structures, and the easiest way for, for, reason for anyone to get those basic skills is to enroll into a university course. I agree. Um, so we mentioned um, at one moment um, cars that are run by AI. So 
Uh, there is a very um, interesting problem in uh, ethics, and everybody who had ethics in school probably heard of it. It's called the trolley problems. So basically, the driver needs to decide um, are they going to um, run over one person or hit a large number of persons? So uh, without uh, getting into the, definitely into the trolley problem and ethics discussion, uh, my actual question is, uh, with increased number of AI in cars, so somebody needs to um, make a decision for that uh, program that's run in the car. So uh, do you think that ethics is important? And since it's not actually studied in our technical universities, should it be part of our um, courses for uh, programmers? At our faculty, it is actually. I had ethics, so that makes me a very good AI developer. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but to answer your question, uh, to, to answer your question, I, uh, you have to understand that <laughs> if all cars have AI in them, or you know, you will never be in a situation that you're going to hit anybody. Or you know, if if everything is control it's controllable by AIs, then it's very difficult to imagine a situation you know where you can. I mean, obviously, someone can run in the road in front of you, okay? But if we program our AIs to go so that they can stop almost immediately, you're not going to be able to hit someone. Uh, and another thing is. We program our uh, self-driving cars to drive like us. So th your question is actually the trolley problem is what would a person do? Because the self-driving car will do exactly the same as it thinks that you will do. So I don't think it's, it's human ethics then problem, not uh, AI ethics problem. Because you're modeling uh, 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 the, uh, the, the self-driving car to behave like a human is driving. It's not like, s I don't know what is driving it. Uh, do you think we need to regulate it um, legally in any way? How do you mean regulate it? Uh, regulate it as a country, like in the so laws? To allow self-driving cars or...? Uh, to s have some general ethics in our um, laws? I, I'm not sure. I, d I don't think that's on to me to, okay. to, to answer as as a uh, ethic uh, taught AI developer. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about ethics and self-driving cars? Uh, I, I believe that we, as a society, have experienced similar situations. For example, medical medical doctors in extreme situations have to deal with precisely those issues. Uh, for for example, it's it's imagine a war situ a war situ a war, and then there is a <coughs> some mobile army surgery hospital, you know, and wounded soldiers are being brought in immediately. The first thing a medical doctor do is a triage. It's a horrible thing for a human being to be forced to do, but that's the first thing to do. All the wounded soldiers are triaged and separated into groups. No help for them, just let them die. We can help those. We we'll fix those. We, so we, as a society, have experience with that. Let's go with medical doctors and ask them how they are trained to do it. I don't know. So uh, I agree with Nemanja that it's, 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 it, it is an important ethical issue, but I believe that every society has certain ethical standards built into their constitutions and laws, and those ethical standards apply universally. And even then, of course, it's not contradictory to ethical standards to be able to make hard decisions, and we have professionals who are trained to do it, so let's get to them and ask them. Okay. Uh, questions? S so, okay. so I have a question. I, I don't know, is it, I don't have a proof that it was a real experiment, but mm -hmm. it w maybe it was just a buzz in the newspaper, like 
what well, is suffering regarding the AI, but I think that the situation is a possible. So, like, there is a car that's self-driven, uh, totally by AI, <laughs> and it has two possible collision course. One with the school bus full of kids, another with the wall. If it accepts that it will collide with the school bus, there is a possibility for car and the driver to survive, uh, but there are major casualties um, with kids. And if it decides to go to towards <coughs> the wall, it's definitely a death situation to to the driver. And <coughs> in that experiment, if if happened, I don't I, I haven't explored it, but it's interesting. Um, the way people think. <laughs> yeah, like yes, people, but people, people, well, people in eight out of the ten always choose to hit the wall. AI always have chosen to hit the. I think that that that's the point where your human instinct kicks in and you know will to survive and you go and hit the bus well uh, it, it it was it was it was different because like uh, majority of the tests that they, they took in in consideration that like the uh, majority of the tests were parents the mm -hmm. folks that took the option of 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 going Hitting to bus yeah, but, or but it's, di parents. it's different to ask something someone that and actually put them in that situation yeah. Well, yeah. But just I mean, is there maybe there could there could be a checkbox, you know, in your software. <laughs> like save me or save the others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's 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 interesting in interesting because question. Their parents, they don't want to die because of their kids. Uh -huh. yeah. their instinct, their instinct to survive will be even more stronger to survive because of their kids, because otherwise okay. their kids would be alone. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the instinct that you can know what will happen only when it happens. Yes, so the, 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 the I think the correct way to judge what a self-driving car sh should do in that situation is to uh, find these situations that already happened and make uh, a study or analysis what people did in those situations. And you know, it was it real study? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter, it's a good, it's a good uh, okay, we talking have point. Okay, we have a question. One more? Okay, so... Um, Somebody asked, uh, do we need laws? My question is, do we need testing? So somebody creates, let's not call it an AI, let's call it just an expert system for driving. Who licenses that system? Who says, okay, this system is now cool and we trust it to be used to transport humans? Um, who tests the brakes on your car? Uh, exactly, we have uh, each year, <laughs> person has to go and check everything and see that it works. So you're saying that something like that would need to be uh, added to the procedure. Yes, just like every other system you're using that is critical, like okay. brakes. Uh, then if I write my own expert system and install it, basically if I build my own car, would I be able to take it to road? Okay, that's a very good question. Would I believe a self-driving car that someone fixes themselves? It's a very difficult and good question. <laughs> maybe, maybe I can help. If, you, if I built my own car, mechanical car, I would have to go through the licensing procedure, right? I won't be able to drive it on the road. And the licensing procedure uh, implies... Well, you would be able to drive it on the road. No, of course not. The police would stop me immediately. Uh, until the police stops you, oh you're well, completely okay. able to run and drive <laughs> the road. Well, then, but then we are discussing, you know, rogue behavior. Then you can say, what, what if I go to the kitchen, grab a knife, and just go out and start you know, <laughs> waving with the knife? So uh, we have to agree first, are we going to follow certain procedures or not? So you're saying uh, government should invest in uh, knowing expert systems? Of course. <laughs> uh, actually, g uh, governments should appoint companies independent bodies whose job is to provide tests for all the systems that are in daily use. That's a standard behavior. We'll just add another licensing body. Okay. And another question. Uh, so you mentioned medical triage. Mm -hmm. uh, if we imagine that as an uh, expert system, uh, how, how far do you think humans will trust it? You see, an expert system is a system which incorporates human experience. So it's a system that does not make decisions based on algorithms, but be based on human experience turned into an appropriate 
So through algorithm. heuristics, through yeah. Yeah. a large yeah. number of yeah. li- through yes. huge amounts of data, yes. through huge yes. number yes. of experiments, yes. it knows whether this human should die or not. So my question is No, it doesn't know. It doesn't make the decision. Expert system o- systems over make a suge- ex- uh, um, uh, You're no, saying no. you need an expert You need an expert to read the data from the expert system and then to implement it. Okay. And potentially this expert system that you're mentioning could be miles better than a human in uh, in a de- same situation. Okay, so uh, then you're saying that basically self-driving cars and an expert system needs a driver. Of course. So it will never be... It, no, it doesn't need a driver. It needs human experience encoded into the software. Oh yep. Okay, so uh, miss, uh, uh, do you form of an expert? Is that someone who uh, reads out, who interprets the outputs, or someone who programs the uh, system? Uh, both. So you do need basically a driver as someone who interprets. Well, at the moment we do have semi-autonomous, let's say, trucks or already operational in the United States. Those semi-autonomous trucks operate like they, they have a driver except that the human driver can relax from time to time an autonomous car uh, truck can actually drive for itself and then if it senses a delicate situation I- its job is to wake up the driver and let it uh, operate the truck as a human being same uh, with planes so planes can take off yes, and it land it and whatever but you still need someone there yes at this point so you're not seeing this uh, need for a human expert to go away soon uh, yeah, of course the only uh, the option that would allow humans to relax well driving cars to relax completely are the options that actually uh, Elon Musk is trying to uh, to advocate you know you have large tubes fully uh, uh, how should I put it now? My English is failing. Uh, fully isolated, yes, from the environment. And then you can have automatic uh, cars operating uh, autonomously. So the That's pro- the only safe environment for automatic so, cars. So the problem is with the environment, not with the self-driving car. Okay, If you program a car to drive, you know, stay in the lane, and uh, it, it will do it. But the problem is what can happen to around it. That's the problem. So if you isolate it, then of course you can sleep while it's going. And just to, to, to go back to your initial question, you said, uh, should an expert be present when, uh, when that is uh, somehow programmed into an expert system, but it's same with cars. I mean, d- letting an algorithm drive your car can result in your debt. So it's not that different. Okay, uh, before we continue, I just need, uh, since it's uh, 7.30, how much time do we have for? Six? Six. Okay. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> then, uh, would you like you, uh, to continue? Okay. I have one question. Since you already mentioned several things, like let's call it expert systems, uh, there are certain researches and uh, certain products and plans for something to be used, like self driving cars. I'm not into that and I'm not following it, but uh, can you count some project that's uh, at the moment uh, very present at the market? So we have a self-driving cars. Uh, what, what is actually present, uh, trucks in the in, uh, US? Uh, what is currently at I- on the market? What is used and what is uh, the plan to be used in, let's say, uh, next 30 years or something like that? Well, what is actually it? Mm-hmm. At the moment, yep. what we have, what we have the at the moment, which works and you can buy for thirty or so thousand dollars, are Tesla, uh, Teslas. Okay, Tesla has an autopilot that can drive autonomously. However, a driver is requested to operate the car every fifteen minutes. So you can, no, seriously, yes. If you switch the autopilot on, you can relax for fifteen minutes, but then the par- the car will indicate that you have to grab the wheel and steer the car for some time, then you can relax for 15 minutes again. If you fail to do it, Tesla will punish you and won't switch the autopilot until the next recharge. 
No, seriously, that's the, that's a safety mechanism. Cool. Yep. Uh, anything else? Sorry, <laughs> not only car industry. Okay, no, uh, combines. Car industry. Combines. You know, I've seen a combine at the uh, fair here in Novi Sad two years ago. There was a huge combine which can actually operate autonomously. A human driver is needed only to take it to the field. So it does not drive through the streets. However, once you take a human, takes the combine to the field, there is a system where the, the driver can simply, he has a map or she has a map, then he or she can simply um, designate pl or plot the boundary of the field, switch the autopilot and enjoy. Because the autopilot can automatically uh, harvest, harvest the field. Perfect. Th you, can, you can buy that in Novi Sad. I just remember this story, I don't know if you know about this, I think Volvo or someone mm -hmm. was testing a concept where you can, you know, pull up to some place mm -hmm. and the car goes and parks itself. Yeah, and uh, Volkswagen. Volkswagen, yeah. You can actually buy that Volkswagen, certain model, I don't know which one, can park automatically. Yeah, but how do you know where it is? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> how do you know where it parks? No, 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 okay, okay. <laughs> I cons I considered buying that car that Volvo, oh, but okay. it was far too expensive for my pay grade. <laughs> um, so um, the self parking works as follows: first, you have to align the car with the parking slot, parking lot. Oh, no, no, no. I, I think yeah, I, I know about that. You have to align the car with the parking lot. Press the button and relax. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I think also a Lancia. There was a Lancia Delta. I was planning to buy. It. They, <laughs> said they have this sensor yeah. for self parking. Uh, clearly, people who are not good at. <laughs> <laughs> Anything parking. else about <laughs> health or or anything like no. uh, not car wise? Okay, th th uh, there was a recent there was a recent uh, event. Uh, you may have followed this story. Uh, uh, Boeing Air uh, Boeing Max eight and nine planes mm -hmm. had two large crashes uh, a few months back. Maybe you followed that story. It was uh, the point. Uh, the autopilot was uh, programmed incorrectly. Uh, and that was a huge uh, source of investigation. And maybe that's somehow a story that wraps up this discussion because, so you had a licensing body in the United States, FAA, which actually licensed the plane and the, the software running in the plane. And there were two consecutive crashes that uh, appeared at, uh, in the same, under the same set of circumstances. So the planes were grounded. It was a few months ago. And now the Boeing and FBI are conducting a very serious investigation and s people will be jailed for, for missteps in licensing, li producing and licensing the software. Oh, actually, the plane. Yeah. Um, so I just want to give you an answer because I had a chance to drive a Tesla. <laughs> so uh, I went to my friends uh, to California. I have worked for that guy, and the one moment he gave me to drive Tesla, it was like, "You are not like if I scratch it, I don't have like <laughs> you for the next two lives. I won't pay you." And he uh, first he was uh, he was uh, sat at the safe mode. So and the guy told me like, "Please change the lanes now, right now." And I said, "No, the car behind will hit me." And he said, yes, try it. And Tesla disobeyed because it gave me a ton of warnings. Uh, display changed colors, you know. And like, I was not able to change the li lanes. And the next stuff, like, he, uh, when we were going back, he uh, took his car on autopilot to home. And like, in one moment, he was able to change the seats from this position to like this, and the m multimedial stuff started running the games on like, and yeah, in uh, 10 to 15 minutes, it was obliged to switch and to take the wheel again in order for Tesla to know that he's present and driving. And after, after two, three minutes again, it was the uh, autopilot. So yeah, there is a thing that you can buy that's almost autonomous driving, so. That's the answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, we know that there are a lot of security concerns, uh, not just with self-driving cars, but uh, generally with artificial intelligence. So what do you think are the, mo the biggest um, security concerns you can think of with artificial intelligence at the moment? 
Okay, so I think there's two questions there. One of it is uh, using AI to somehow uh, avoid some security measures, and the other one is security of AI. So, uh, the, how to put it, the data that you're using can be sensitive or can be, you know, personal data, and should you be using it to train something that maybe you don't fully understand in case of machine learning? And so, uh, for the quir first questions, we have seen a lot of uh, works recently, especially, that you can, uh, for example, I saw this one uh, paper that describes that you can, uh, they model this neural network so it, uh, it can, uh, from uh, so it, the first input is uh, a any a person speaking something, and it can learn the the uh, di uh, different oscillations in their voice and the movements of their mouth and translate it to another video. Okay, so basically you can have a video of someone with you know it's not that difficult to fake voice these days. So you can have this completely fake video which looks completely. They did it with Trump, obviously. So you can find it. I think it's on YouTube. But, uh, you know, y they can make this video that looks really, you know, uh, realistic and, uh, and correct, uh, that he was talking about something that he didn't talk about or even close. It was something funny, not something politically uh, incorrect. So there is, the, uh, we are at uh, a, a stage where AI can be used for, let's say, bad things, but it's, I think, true for uh, many other things. It's, I don't think it's uh, specifically an AI problem. I mean, you, you can use uh, software in uh, completely wrong ways to make harm to someone, not just AI software. The, the, the second part with security, way, that's uh, really, uh, you know, uh, it's a difficult, uh, di difficult question about, uh, about that. So the data that you're using for training, for example, a neural network, somehow remains in that neural network. And there are some uh, academic papers where you can see that this data can be extracted from these uh, model weights. So that's another thing that you have to consider if your model is somehow, if you are giving someone to use your machine learning model, you're maybe involuntarily giving them some sensitive data which is related to security. So, yeah. Uh, what do you think are the biggest concerns uh, with AI? Well, AI is a tool, and just like any other tool, the security issues are related not to the tool, but the way we as humans use the tool. I don't believe that AI can in inadvertently just you know, decide to hack someone. It's a human being using his knowledge and a powerful tool to achieve something. So. Uh, what Nebojša was discussing, uh, Nemanja, sorry, what Nemanja was discussing is, is an issue. So, with uh, complex software systems, it's becoming more and more uh, complicated to actually prove correctness or a certain correct uh, correctness. Uh, that's why I really believe that the future of uh, complex software is in uh, a symbiosis, a two a human and an AI working together on, on a problem. A, uh, computers in general are great at uh, you know, collecting things, uh, quickly processing data, and so everything that humans are bad at. On the other hand, humans are great at you know, intuition, creativity, everything computers are bad at. So let's put the two things together and live happily in symbiosis. And then all the issues that we are discussing actually remain in the realm of humans, the way you use your tools. Uh, I heard about a case, uh, it was, uh, I don't know the name of the company, but it's a bigger company, uh, that used AI to sort uh, CVs that they got. So they were, uh, some of the people who sent the CV thought that the AI was biased, that it uh, chose uh, that it actually uh, chose people uh, by a certain cri criteria. So what do you think, of if we train AI to be biased, of course it can be, but what do we need to think about to um, stop that kind of problem? Okay, so the problem you described is basically because the data that was being used for training this model 
was uh, made by someone who was obviously bi- biased i don't know what uh, i don't know the details but uh the, the 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 data was biased okay so if we want to make a model that is not biased the f- the, the the first uh, step i think the, the best step would be to to s- start with uh, programming it with the da- or actually training it with the data that is not biased it, it it's actually one of the the uh, one of the big problems in in machine learning when you have biased data because then your model will not perform as you want so i if it was intentional then again it's human uh, error or human humanly intentional I, uh, but possibly it was unintentional it's simply that all if they what what they probably did was okay there was this uh, person that was you know sorting these CVs and they just uh, you know monitored what this person was doing and tried to make them uh, make a model uh, to do the same obviously this person was biased so the model was biased so I don't think that's something that can be solved because you know if you train it to represent human behavior and th- that human behavior was biased it will be biased I don't know if I answer your question. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, they say that we are here on the bo- uh, on the Balkans, late with everything for about thirty years, uh, unfortunately. But what do you think? Where are we with artificial intelligence, and um, what can we do to keep up with the rest of the world? I think we are fine. I think the problem is not, you know, Serbia, Balkans, whatever. I think it's just individuals versus Google Brain versus Facebook AI research versus any entity that has a lot of personal data that they can use to to train their models. So it's not, you know, shortage of knowledge. It's shortage of data, I think, that's causing this uh, uh, difference between... uh, some research groups and others. What do you think? Uh, uh, well, uh, if you if you look at the history of AI, from the fifties to let's say the nineties, AI was typically an academic research field, and then they have a hu- uh, somehow a huge shift, and from the let's say in the twenty first century, AI research has become a typically uh, a research in industry. So companies with huge resources, huge um, uh, supplies of hardware and data started uh, producing f- really available and useful software. The, the shift has become simply because <coughs> we've given up the academic approach, like trying to build very complicated algorithms that simulate or emulate types of behavior, and we've moved to an engineering approach Let's sift through this data and see what's a typical behavior. So, uh, as Nevaya said, I believe that academically we are not lagging behind. However, we are lagging beca- behind in the in the uh, on the practical level simply because there are no large companies in in Balkans that are willing to invest this amount of money into the engineering approach to AI, which is the predominant approach to AI nowadays. Okay, we have a question. I heard a talk by a physicist called Michio Kaku th- mm-hmm. and uh, he's trying to evaluate the advancement of general AI. Now, I know what we said about general one, but let's just say there is a general AI framework in which you could uh, train your AI or evaluate it, how smart it is. His statement was that our AI on a general level is on a level of a retarded cockroach. Just to be really explicit, how smart is our um, artificial intelligence Mm -hmm. compared to the child, cat, uh, rat. cockroach, rat, whatever. <laughs> where are we today and where are we in, I don't know, let's say 100 years? Well, I would never compare uh, our AIs to any uh, biological thing because 
we are talking about, you know, inco I believe that we are talking about incomparable entities and uh, inco incomparable uh, evolution processes, you know. Living beings have evolved over mi millions of years in order to optimize certain things so that they can survive. AIs have never had this opportunity and actually are in simply unable to reproduce that. Because it's simply, you know, these are two different entities, uh, different kingdoms, you know, the kingdom of the living and the kingdom of the silicon. So it's, you, know, you should never compare insects to mammals because, because there are two different kingdoms. Within this kingdom, we can compare insects, you know. Okay, le let me be more explicit. Okay. At the start, we said we want to debunk some of the media mm -hmm. sources yeah. or yeah. media that, uh, that are feeding us the info. One of the info is how intelligent is the intelligence. So in that particular view, how would you say how, how intelligent it is? I know that uh, okay. educated people know when you say they are not comparable what you mean, but I think the, the, pop, uh, the most of the population won't get that. Uh, okay, yeah. Well, in this direction, let's go back to the Turing test. You know, that's the only uh, uh, hands-on uh, test that we have. And if you take a look at the history of software that tried to uh, history of attempts to pass the Turing to, pa to pass the Turing test, the best we got was something like twenty percent, twenty to th between twenty and thirty percent. Let's go. Let, let, let's say thirty percent. So the, uh, uh, you're all familiar with the Turing test, I guess. I don't have to. Uh, okay. So since on the human side of the Turing test, you have average humans, and on the and the, our artificial intelligence is scored 20 percent of that. Let's say that our AIs are at most 20 percent in average human intelligence, which means IQ 20. Okay. Okay. Uh, j uh, so sorry, j j just. Uh, uh, for those of you who have had psychology, everything be below IQ 50 or 60 is called deep retardation and so sh should be institutionalized and, you know, is uh, unable to take care of itself or so. So we are around, let's say, IQ 20. IQ 20. Okay, I would like to conclude with this question. Uh, are there any more questions from the audience or should we finish up? Okay, so I'm not really sure this is going to make sense. I was reluctant to ask uh, because I do not understand enough uh, about the machine learning to, to uh, understand. Uh, and also it uh, connects to the, the biology and psychology, uh, the connection. Uh, do you believe... <coughs> Okay, uh, for, for all the software developers, uh, it's a concept like uh, the C compiler is written in C. Do you believe uh, it could be possible to use uh, machine learning uh, to analyze uh, our uh, behavior, uh, not behavior as in psychology, uh, the way our mind works, the, the synapses, the neurons, to develop itself <laughs> in a way or sense? So uh, it, it's a... Uh, of course, uh, that also ties to the technology of uh, uh, medical on how to the sensors that actually can detect in order to, to provide a visible space for the, for the machine learning. I mean, uh, the, the sensors to inputs. Uh, so, yeah, that if, I, if that makes okay, sense. Okay, so it's, it, it's funny if you think about it, but it's already happening. So if you're programming a neural network... Th that is true, but... Uh, 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 our interface to the to the machine learning at this moment is our hands. So, uh, well, okay, brain, but we type the code to to, analyze, to do the step. Uh, so, if we uh, write the code to to make the machine learn from us, uh, like uh, we attach it to our heads. There are quite a lot of people around here, so you can actually put sensors, or heads, or whatever, on the all the world, whatever, uh, to help us understand how we think, how we interact, how we solve problems, or maybe uh, to take it a step uh, uh, lower, uh, let's say, uh, analyze how do we uh, approach a simple problem, what happens to our brains for any, uh, for, <coughs> let's say, 
huge amount of people on, on this planet that, that does the same, uh, like the data that comes from them, from the same problem and their process of thinking and the, how the, the sensors uh, detect the, the, the um, neural uh, interactions in our brain to, to understand and see the pattern or could we use it as an extension of ourselves to understand uh, or the meaning of our behavior, the, the life, or maybe is the, that uh, uh, biomechanical barrier cannot be breached. So. Okay, so there, there was an interesting, uh, I think it, yes, it was a, a paper that uh, we, al we already know how to connect an artificial neural network to a biological neural network. So I think it was a rat brain, I don't know. So there were some probes and it was connected somehow. So a signal propagating from an artificial neural network was going over and something was happening. What you're talking about is, you know, uh, wearing this kind of, I don't know, sensor suit or something for your entire life and, you know, collecting all this data and, you know, then teaching a neural network to behave the same as you. But you have to understand, that, like in your brain, there are billions of neurons, and we don't know how to connect them. We I, I or get their state, or, ge or get, get their, their state. individual yes, state. You have thousands and thousands or millions of sensors o on your body, so and you have to capture that all for I don't know, eighty, ninety, hundred years for w one a life lifespan. So. In theory, I think it would be maybe possible, but we are not there technologically. Thank you. Would you like to add something? Uh, well, the problem is that uh, now, uh, if you try to de debug our thinking, I mean, people have been tr trying to do that for thousands of years, and we are unable to do it. Simply, we do not, und we cannot formalize our mental processes. We don't know how we solve mathematical problems, elementary school mathematical problems. We cannot reproduce this type of behavior. Can we use uh, machine learning to help us identify that? I strongly believe, but this is my personal belief, that it's not possible. There is an extra quality involved. You know, when, when I try to solve mathematical problems, I do not go through an algorithmic process. And actually, there is an article from the 19th century uh, a very well famous mathematician, mathematician, Henri Poincaré, was concerned about how he is able to prove theory. It's the beginning of psychology, you know, psychoanalysis was very popular at that time, and he was a mathematician, and he was actually trying to contribute to, to psychoanalysis by analyzing his own mental processes. He was a very good mathematician, I mean, children, uh, our students learn his theorems, so he actually spent several years observing his own behavior while he is working on mathematical problems. And he actually identified four faces. I will give you all the four, so just to see what was the tricky part. So the first phase is accumulation. You start solving a problem, you accumulate, you read everything that's available to accumulate some knowledge. Uh, then the second phase is, oh gosh, accumulation, you accumulate knowledge, then, uh, comes frustration because you try to solve the problem and you're not able to do it and then comes distraction and he identified distraction as the uh, as the key element of solving problems then someone has to distract your consciousness so that the subconscious part of your brain can solve the problem and then comes the solution so th this is a point Carrie, you can find it online. It's available online as, as a text. It was a text published in some psychological uh, So it's the journal. same like when you're trying to fall asleep and then you think, I know why my build was failing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so and, and the, key, get the key issue is distraction. So he, uh, in, the, in, the, in this paper, he lists several situations when he was working on really complicated, serious, deep mathematical problems where the solution came the moment he was distracted. So the moment his consciousness left the problem alone, the subconscious part did something and the problem was solved. And the solution just popped into his consciousness, then he wrote down the solution and wrote a paper and published it, blah, blah, blah. But the key problem to solving the, so the key phase in solving problems is the part when your consciousness was not engaged into solving problems. That's interesting. Henri Poincaré. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, I think we can discuss this thing for like the whole night, but uh, we would like to finish up. Be and um, I would like to thank you all for um, attending this discussion. And uh, we hope to see you all n next year. <laughs>